safe in 1978. Just to give you some simple stuff to start out with costs and things. New house might run you at $54,800. Today, that would be, and if you translate that into modern money, about 213000 That's about right. Uh, in my market, you can probably get it for less. Uh, but for most markets, a good house about that amount of money. Uh, certainly better than you can get if you're trying to get something in like, you know, Los Angeles or even worse, San Francisco, uh, but still a pretty well one-to-one -one sort of trade-off there. Uh, Larry says, was it a TV grab for ratings? Oh, yeah. 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 The, the Star Wars holiday special is aired was simply there to kind of keep Star Wars in the minds of the public and that's all it's there for. Fism Bujum at Teak Teak for their bag. Anything you said to me, big mistake. Yeah. At the costs, uh, average income at that time was about $17,000. Today, that would translate into about $66,000. So you would be doing better at that time. The median income in the U.S. is around $42,000 now. Rent at that time would have been about $260, which translates into about $1,000 today. That's good. Uh, in my market, you can get a decent place for about $1,000 if it's not a family one. Uh, you certainly can't get that in large metropolitan areas. Gallon of gasoline at that time cost 63 cents, which translates into about 2,044 cents today. That's about a wash. And if you were buying Star Wars pajamas, well, depending on how big you were, whether you're a, 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 you know, a child or an adult, that might run you anywhere from about 650 to about $12 today. That would translate into about $25 to about $47. Not having attempted to buy uh, any of those things, I don't know how that stacks up. Now, then there was the Tandy TRS-80. The Radio Shack Tandy TRS-80 was released in this year, and that would have cost you about $400. Today, that would translate into about $1,500. Um, that makes sense, actually. That was a new computer, one of the first home computers ever made, and $1,500 would be about right for something that is a brand new high-end computer today. Now, that computer got a reputation in IT and years later is being called the Trash 80. Um, and that's because the first edition in particular was very, very buggy. It was one of the first personal computers ever made, but it was not an IBM compatible, com compatible computer as we know today. It did not run MS-DOS. Uh, it ran something called Tandy TRS-DOS, and it would never have run MS-DOS programs if you tried. But until 1982, the TRS-80 was actually the best-selling personal computer line. It outsold the Apple II series by a factor of five, so it was a big thing. Uh, Starbase Operations uh, 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 by BBS ran on a TRS-80 Model 3. Yep. Yep, that was another thing that happened. This year was the first year that there was computer bulletin board systems. Now, as an aside, what you're seeing here is my first computer. Or rather, it's my father's first business computer that he got in 1978. It is the Ohio Scientific C8PDF computer. It was billed as IBM compatible, but again, not what we would think of today. It did not run DOS. It was not a PC. Um, you could not run DOS programs, but you could, at least in theory, take the information that was on the 8-inch floppies that I think at that point were 480K, uh, and you could load this information into an IBM mainframe. Never did it, never even thought about trying, but at least theoretically you could. This was not, however, my first uh, entry into computers. Uh, I had taken a programming class the year before in 1977 at a summer school course when I was in middle school. They used teletype terminals, which is what you're seeing here, that connected to the Lincoln Public Schools mainframe via acoustic modem, which is what you're seeing here. It was about 300 bits per second, and I learned the basic programming language at that time. But that C8PDF was the first computer that I had my hands on, and it launched me into 40 years in IT. 
Uh, Marshall says, ooh, shiny, and the only way, uh, in, the, in a way, only a true fart computer geek could consider shiny. Yes, absolutely, I considered it shiny. I was one of the first people, I was the only one in middle school and later even high school that was turning in papers that were printed on a dot matrix printer. Your dad's office used CPM. Yeah, there were computers out near that time that started using the operating system CPM. Digital Equipment to Corporation Terminals. Yes, this is a DEC um, something writer. I've forgotten what it is, but that's what we used. Uh, you didn't have a monitor. You typed things in, and it spit out on the paper. In point of fact, I got someone to give me an account on uh, when I went to college on a mainframe there, and I ran the uh, computer game Trek. There are somewhere deep, deep in the labyrinths of the, uh, um, you know, landfills and dumps in Lincoln, Nebraska, page upon page upon page of this double-wide black, a uh, green and white paper on which I was playing this game. <laughs> uh, still play it today. It's still out there, believe it or not. Other things that were happening in 1978, one of the biggest ones was the Jonestown Massacre. Now, to give you some a background on this, I've got to go a little bit back farther in time. In 1958, a cult called the People's Temple was formed by uh, Jim Jones in Indianapolis. In 1956, he moved it to Ukiah, California, and then in 1971 to San Francisco. But between 1974 and 1977, a group of these temple members followed Jones to a compound in Guyana, South America, that they called Jonestown. Now, the reason they did this was because Jones was being charged with financial fraud, and they simply wanted to flee the country. <laughs> uh, I know the guy, Marshall says, who wrote both Trek and Wind Trek, Joe Jaworski, worked with him in California. That is cool. That is cool. I've played track a zillion times. If you got an account on sdf.org, and if you're any kind of computer geek, I suggest it. Trek is still out there. Uh, yeah, Drink the Kool-Aid came from this cult. I'll get to that in a second. So on November 17th, U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan visited Jonestown with some observers and journalists at the request of the former People's Temple member and the uh, relatives of current members. This is a cult. This is a complete cult. And uh, several of those members who were in the compound asked Ryan for help returning to the United States, and this angered Jones, who feared, rightly, that his followers would defect, and he ordered the group to kill the five witnesses, including the congressman. Fortunately, that never happened. However, later that night, on November 17th, the Star Wars Holiday Special aired. And then, on November 18th, the day after... Jones commanded his followers to drink, drink poisoned punch, and many of them did it willingly, but there are, is evidence that some of them had to be forced to do so by other uh, uh, cult members or by armed guards. And there was, in that massacre, a death toll of 900 people, more than 300 of which were children. And Jones was himself found dead of gunshot wounds. Some other things going on there. Gold had reached an all-time high of $200 per ounce. I invite you to laugh at that compared to what it's worth now. The world's population was estimated at about $4.4 billion, And after 30 years, the Volkswagen Beetle stopped production. Also that year, Roman Polanski fled to France mere hours before he was going to be formally sentenced for rape and other charges against a child. He remains in exile today. But the amazing thing is, the Hollywood left loves him. Meryl Streep has praised him. Quentin Tarantino is an apologist for him, and this is why if he directs a Star Trek movie, I will never watch it. World unemployment had risen after several decades of full employment. And another fun thing that happened this year was the oil tanker Amico Cadiz ran aground on the coast of Brittany in France and created an oil slick 18 miles wide and 80 miles long that covered about 200 miles of the Brittany coast. In the U.S., well, of course, on September, November 17th, the Star Wars Holiday Special aired. Jimmy Carter was president at that time. Serial killer David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam, 
is sentenced, was sentenced that year to six consecutive life sentences for having killed eight people in New York, and he remains in prison to this day. The Senate ratified the second of the Torrejos Carter Treaties, which guaranteed that the United States would hand back control of the Panama Canal by the end of 1999, which did happen. The U.S. had had control since 1903. The United States then banned all of the latest computer technology, not, could not sell it to the Soviet Union, still the Cold War. And the U.S. stopped production of the neutron bomb, which you don't hear much about today. Interesting sort of weapon, unlike a nuclear weapon. It kills the people, but it keeps buildings and infrastructure intact. U.S. had a teacher's strike. The U.S. dollar plunged to new record lows. But the first female astronauts were around. There was Shannon Lucid, who became the first American woman to visit the Mir space station. Margaret Ray Seddon. Catherine Sullivan, who became the first w American woman to perform a spacewalk. Judith Resnick, Anna Fisher, and Sally Ride, who became the first American woman in space. Israel, as always, was having problems. But Israel and Egypt that year signed the Camp David Accords, which ended a 31-year state of a war between the two nations that had existed since the creation of the State of Israel. Israel attacked Lebanon in a retaliation for a bus hijacking that had occurred in Tel Aviv. Now, interesting thing about what was going on in some of the religious world, the Catholic side of things in Rome. Pope Paul VI died, and on October 26th, Pope Paul I became post Pope, but he died 33 days later, only 33 days later, and we got Pope John Paul II, who was around for quite a long time, and if you weren't, didn't live through any of his, I suggest you read him up. He's a very interesting guy. Uh, he was attempted to be assassinated once, which uh, caused him to create what they called the Pope Mobile. Uh, because he used to go everywhere. He just did a ton of, uh, of, of you know, going over, all over the world. And so they made this, this thing that he could sit in that was basically surrounded by bulletproof glass. So he could not, uh, the attempt in his life might not happen again. In Japan, uh, Naomi Urema became the first person to reach the North Pole in a solo expedition. And Japanese car imports accounted at that point for more than half the U.S. import market. In Great Britain, uh, well, they had a public service strike that was problematic. The European Court of, um, of Human Rights found the U.K., uh, government guilty of mistreatment of prisoners in Northern Ireland. There has been for a long time now, centuries, of uh, some level of um, problems between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, and they were having problems with outright terrorism. So that's where that came from. And this year, the world's first uh, 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 human that was conceived through in, in vitro th fertilization, Louise Brown, was born on July 25th in the UK. Now, she was called a test tube baby by the press, and that's something that stuck. We still hear it today. The whole thing was done by Robert Edward, and he won the Nobel Prize in 2010 for that. A few other things. The Dominican Republic became independent from Great Britain. Spain established a new constitu constitution. Sweden became the first nation to ban aerosol sprays that are thought to do damage the Earth's protective ozone layer. And in fact, that went worldwide. We do not have aerosol sprays now in the United States. In Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, the prime minister and three black leaders agreed on the transfer to black majority um, rule. Other things. Illinois Bell uh, c c created the first ever cellular phone s network, but that would not become standard until the 1990s. And then there's Space Invaders, the uh, computer game Space Invaders, launched a huge uh, craze for computer video games. These would lead to arc video arcades that I went to a lot. These were buildings that basically had, or, or businesses that had lots and lots of video games in them, arcade video games, where you paid about a quarter. Uh, these are now gone because why would we have them when we have all these fun, you know, home games? There, there it says, uh, Kennedy chose to uh, not to use a bulletproof uh, clear top on the car in Dallas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, afterwards, I mean, now it's about impossible to attack the president for any number of reasons. 
films that were popular in 1978. Grease, Saturday Night Fever, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, National Lampoon's Animal House, Jaws 2, Heaven Can Wait, Star Wars, Revenge of the Pink Panther, and The Deer Hunter. In music, the Bee Gees were big with their songs Saturday Night Live and Stayin' Alive. Paul McCartney and Wings was big. John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John, as the result of Grease, in which they starred, were also big. Although, funny thing... At the time, my friends and I called her Oblivious Neutron Bomb. The Rolling Stones were big, and the Commodore song, Three Times a Lady, was huge. Yup. Oh, man. Disco was big. Yes, disco was big. Uh, and uh, Marshall says, uh, Grease was the word on Saturday night, Saturday night. Yeah. My sister loved Grease. I thought it was okay, but she would sing those songs over and over and over and over. See, I was 13, so she would have been about 10. <laughs> I got to hear those songs from that thing over and over. Now, interesting thing on TV. Um, varieties had been very big in the 1970s. Variety shows where you had, you know, all kinds of different acts. You would have musical numbers, you would have stand-up, you might have sketches. Very, very big throughout most of the 1970s. However, by 1978, it was starting to wane. Public consciousness was not mo was moving away from that in terms of something else, which makes the decision to attempt to turn Star Wars into a variety show, which is what this piece of crap is, you know, as a whole did, kind of weird. You know, people were not really watching that anymore. But shows that were big at that time, Happy Days, Little House on the Prairie, The Rockford Files, Good Morning America, Saturday Night Live, back when they were actually funny, Wheel of Fortune, Charlie's Angels, Quincy M.E., The Muppet Show, Chips, which, by the way, had a character played by Michael Dorn, who was a recurring police officer on that, The Love Boat, Three's Company, and there was something big that happened that year. Uh, Larry Larry says, Carol Burnett show was over. Yes, Carol Burnett was over by then, although she did have some other specials uh, past then. But she had a basically a variety show. And uh, as I talk about the costumer for that, you'll see a lot of interesting things there. Uh, but yeah, Carol Burnett was big uh, in the mid-1970s, kind of went away. Uh, too bad. I've seen stuff from her in the 1970s that are now on YouTube, and they're usually very damn funny. Particularly if you find some of the outtakes. Those are great. However, in 1978, on October 14th and 21st, the castaways of Gilligan's Island were rescued after 15 years. However, Tina Louise did not uh, reprise her role as uh, Ginger Grant. However, a few months later, on a reunion cruise, the castaways were re-shipwrecked on the exact same island, directly due to Gilligan's utter incompetence. And for some reason, the remaining castaways did not murder Gilligan on the spot and leave his body for the sharks. But fortunately, within a few days, the castaways were rescued again by the Navy. And a year later, Mr. Howell opened a resort on that island. And basically, they had uh, love boat style adventures at that point. And in 1981, the Harlem Globetrotters visited the island, and you can barely see it in this picture, but they faced off against a team made up of robots. Yeah. Okay, fashion of the time, men's fashion. Um, things had changed a bit since the 1960s. Uh, you didn't see quite the same amount of color that you did in the 60s. 60s were a very colorful era for the uh, for clothes. And what you can see on this side is what uh, a fairly well-dressed man might wear. The, the uh, styles had changed. This would have been more like uh, Sunday go to meet in clothes. This was not what you would wear necessarily uh, in public. However, I can tell you, I was at a parochial school. Uh, Marshall says, spoiler, the Globetrotters were on. Yeah, well, what would you expect? They, they enlisted Gilligan in their um, stupid team. You know, it was all for dumb laughs. Um, but uh, fashions at this point, again, this is stuff that you might see men wearing under, you know, relatively uh, structured conditions where you needed a suit. I myself went to a parochial school at that time that required a, um, um, 
a uniform. So at that time, I was wearing a suit, a tie, bell bottoms, like you see here, bell bottoms were big, and platform shoes. Everybody had platform shoes, not necessarily the platform, but heels. I certainly remember wearing heels at that time. Uh, the other side here is what your average, uh, reasonably dressed um, teenager, teenage boy might wear. Uh, you can see, you know, you're getting away with jeans, you're getting away with different kinds of pants, still bell bottoms, still probably those shoes. Um, but you, you got shirts that were a little more colorful. I remember those lines across the side had a lot of those, aside from my Star Trek t-shirts, which were becoming a thing back then. Uh, Larry Larry says, Battle of the Network Stars. Oh, God, yes, Battle of the Network Stars. Watched very often by myself solely so that I could see people like Linda Carter in a swimsuit. <laughs> in terms of women's fashions, a couple of interesting things about this pic. Uh, the one on this side is uh, basically a group photo that was taken for some reason, but I thought it was really good. Uh, you can see things are starting to evolve a bit more, a bit looser clothing. Um, you didn't have the same kind of underwear that you did in the 50s, that's for sure. That was all going away. And on this side, you can see uh, a cutout of uh, a um, fashion magazine of the time. And you can see that women's dresses were becoming a little more flowy, um, lower hemlines. You know, you started out in the 60s with hemline, 50s with hemlines like this. By the end of the 70s, they were up to here, 60s rather, and then by the 70s, they were back down to here. In fact, there's a joke that the skipper makes in uh, uh, Rescue from Gilligan's Island where he saw, says, says to um, Gilligan, boy, we really missed out. You know, hemlines went from here all the way up to here, and now they're back down to here again. Um, so a neat little joke. And you can see here generally more, you know, loose. The hemlines were lower, a little more flowery, a little more loose. Um, still some colors in there, but again, this decade started to lose all of the colors that we had seen as part of uh, the 1960s. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.